Okay, everybody, we're, we're good to go. Thank you all for coming. I'm so excited that this many people decided to come to listen to me talk about my trip for a while. I'm not going to be able to get through this whole presentation because I think there are 55 slides, so I'd have to talk really fast. But I'm going to try to cover the most important things, and then if you have questions later on in the presentation and I didn't cover something, I can always go back and go into more detail. So I want to say a prayer since we're eating to say over our food, so it's okay if you're mid-bite. God doesn't care. Dear God, we thank you for this food and for this time together. We pray that you would help us to uh, have open minds and to hear you speaking and that we would grow closer to you and to each other during this time. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. 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 So I'm going to first just show you pictures and tell you kind of what each day of the trip consisted of. Annie? Yeah, it was the Great Plains Conference. The Mercy and Justice team organized it, and um, it was clergy and laity from all throughout the conference. Thank you. Yeah, good question. So yeah, here's a picture of the, of the group. I think this is most of us in the hotel we stayed at. And the first night of the trip, we just all got together, and for like three hours, every person in the group told their story, or list a little part of their story. It was really neat. And where when, are you? Where am I? Yeah. Oh, gosh. Oh, I'm in the back on a chair. Yeah, yeah that's me. Uh, oh, okay. You see that? Okay. Uh, I was in the back on a chair. And this, the, the coolest, one of the coolest parts of the trip for me was being in a group with so many different kinds of people, different ages, different backgrounds. Like I said, I think I might have said this in some of the services, we had at least three pastors who are from Africa that are serving in our conference currently and two from South Korea, so hearing their immigrant stories and their experiences was very valuable. So that's the group. The next day we woke up and we went right to the river, the Rio Grande, which is actually the border um, until the Rio Grande goes a different direction. But for a lot of Texas, it's the Rio Grande. Well, I think all of Texas. And so I just thought it was interesting because I looked across and there was Mexico. And then we heard from Border Patrol. We had two different Border Patrol agents that talked to us. And I'll be telling you a little bit more about what they told us later on. But I thought this was a very valuable experience to hear from their, hear from their perspective what they're going through on a daily basis. And then, so the first day was a lot of sitting and listening. <laughs> and then we went to a, a place um, and we heard from a lady who's in charge of an organization called Proyecto Azteca, and they help immigrants and just people in general who are in the Rio Grande Valley. Um, there's a lot of poverty there, and the poverty rate is 40%, um, and so they they do a lot there, and that was neat. And then this is where we also heard from Azalea, the federal public defender that, that I talked about. Woo! Yeah! <laughs> and then that night, um, that was the first day, so it was light, a lot of learning. And then the next day we woke up and we went to this place called La Posada Providencia. It's like a sanctuary for asylum seekers. And they can stay there, I think, for up to two years, even longer if they need to. But um, they're, they're waiting for their work permits. And while they're there, they're getting education, counseling. A lot of them have a, tra a lot of trauma they've been through. So this is a place where they go and their kids go to school. Uh, they, it's a very family, community-oriented place. Uh, so here's our group there. And you'll see off in the distance, they're building new residences uh, so that they can have double the capacity they have now. So they'll be able to have 50 people stay there soon. That was uh, on the wall in the kitchen, so I thought it was cool. And then after that, before we went to Catholic Charities, we actually went to downtown McAllen, which is 99% Hispanic. And, you know, you have all the shops and the, the it, it's a whole different kind of world or feel if you've ever been to a very highly or densely populated Hispanic area of town. And so uh, we went there and we worked with one of the churches that's United Methodist Church down there and we handed out free ice cream because it was very hot. It was like 90 some degrees. Um, and that was just to build relationships with people, to get out of our comfort zones, 
and um, it was neat. And then we went to the Catholic Charities Humanitarian Respite Center. Um, and there we heard from a lady named Sister Norma. There's a picture of just what like the main area looks like. The kids were watching Incredibles too. Um, so Sister Norma is the one standing up there and she's in charge of the Respite Center, an amazing person. Um, she works together with the, the mayor of McAllen, Texas. And, and basically they opened this place in 2014 when there was a surge of unaccompanied minors coming and they noticed like these, these children haven't bathed, they haven't had a proper meal and you know for weeks or months. And so this was like the humanitarian, like we need to respond right now. And so they are going to be probably getting a lot busier due to some policy changes that are happening this week um, that I'll talk about later. And then the next day, we went to El Buen Pastor. Uh, it's a church, a United Methodist church, and heard about, um, I think we, the, the scripture was with Elijah and the dry bones and bringing them back to life, talking about how the power of God gives us hope even when things seem hopeless, which is very fitting for the trip because there were times when learning about all this stuff, we felt kind of hopeless and overwhelmed. And so it was a neat church. And I took a picture of this because Bishop Sines, our former bishop, was the pastor there for 10 years. And according to this picture, though, he's still there because there's no end date. Um, so I thought that was kind of fun. So that was Bishop Sines. And then after that, we went to the Jackson Chapel Ranch. This was um, one of the first churches, Spanish-speaking churches in the area. It's no longer like actively were having worship services. It was also a stop along the Underground Railroad uh, oh. because apparently, I didn't know this until the trip, but slaves would escape south to Mexico too because Mexico outlawed slavery, slavery before the US did. And so this was the Jackson Ranch Chapel. And then really close to that was where we went to the wall. And this is, I think it's 30 feet here is what they told us. Um, and we rode along the wall, lots of things, a lot of people got wrote God's love has no borders. Um, you can see where I wrote in orange. And then we sang the song, they will know we are Christians by our love while we walked along the border. And it was a powerful time. Here's the group at the border. It was very hot. <laughs> and then after that, we went to a basilica that is for a specific saint in the Catholic faith. And we, they had the Stations of the Cross, like life-size versions of the Stations of the Cross. So we walked those and did the prayer liturgy. And this was just a way of trying to integrate our faith with everything that we were learning about and experiencing. So I find it to be very powerful and recognize like Jesus suffered when he was on this earth in immense ways. And he knows the suffering of the immigrants and meets them where they're at. And then the last day, we went to the border and we went across it to Nuevo Progreso, Mexico. So here's a picture of the border. Um, there's just a picture of Mexico. I do have to say I was very shocked by how much poverty there was. Um, I've never been to an area that's not a tourist area of another country before. And so this was kind of striking to me to see there was a lot of trash everywhere, and not just like paper trash, but like old appliances, and there were dogs just everywhere in the streets, and um, a lot of a lot of poverty. And there also, their plumbing is not great, and so you can't put toilet paper in the toilets. I learned so otherwise it will overflow. So you put it in a trash can, and that's a very cultural thing because a lot of the Mexicans who live in Texas they still put the trash or the, the toilet paper in the trash can, um, because that's what they're used to. And so anyways, that was just an interesting thing. We went to a place called Casa de la Esperanza, which means a house of hope. This was like an orphanage. Um, and so we got to talk to kids who um, had, their parents were in jail or just not around for, for many reasons. Um, so that was impactful. And then we, this is all run by Manos Juntas, which is a, an organization run by the Mexico um, Methodist Church. This is Pastor Willie. He's a missionary, and he's really awesome. The whole goal of this organization is to bring empowerment to people in Mexico and this, these communities, these border communities, 
so that they have jobs and they have a sense of self-worth and improve their communities in their lives. And so they have a medical clinic that is fully self-sufficient and they pay all of these staff people to, to do that. And so you'll see that's one, one of the people from the trip is with them. But they, I wanted you to see, it's all women. I thought that was cool. <laughs> um, and then we went to a school that Manos Juntos is funding. And this is a school where kids get public education credits. Like they, it, they, it's considered the public education system, but Mexico doesn't give, the government doesn't give any money to this. It's in a very, very poor area. And basically they abandoned the school in the area. And so Manos Juntos came in and said, no, we're gonna keep the school here. They um, sang for us and that was really, beautiful. They, they do teach about Jesus at the school, even though they said that's technically illegal. Um, so I thought that was interesting. Uh, the kids, though, you can tell it's a really good, safe place for them. And they have sewing classes for their parents, who's trying to treat, teach them a trade. But yeah, the poverty in this area was especially crazy. So that's like the day, that's the trip basically. The last day we also did go back and hear from a some more presenters from organizations in McAllen, but that's basically what we did on the trip. And so now I'm going to get into the fire hose of information <laughs> that we learned, and I'm not going to tell you everything because I can't, um, I don't have time, but I want to stop and just pause. I'm not going to, I'm not going to go through all of these slides, but it's important for us to just ground ourselves in scripture, I think, when we're talking about any su subject. And so migration in the Bi and borders in the Bible I would love to teach like a class on this, and if anyone's interested, I, I can let me know, and we can maybe get something going. But I want to note that from the very beginning of Scripture, in Genesis 1, God says to humans, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And I think that we don't always realize, like, filling the earth requires migration. And so migration is, like, embedded in what it means to be human. Um, and then in the Genesis 2 story, we get this idea that the wandering, Cain, or in Ch Genesis 4, Cain is told after he kills Abel that he will be a fugitive and wanderer for his life. And in, in many senses, wandering becomes not just a part of God's plan to fill the earth, but it's also like part of the reality of living in a broken world where the land has famines and droughts and people are moving from place to place following the resources. So just wanted to say like migration in the Bible is both part of God's plan and purpose, but also part of what it means to be in a broken world. And so we know that Abraham or Abram was a migrant. He's the founder of the Jewish faith, basically the father of it. Um, another thing I wanted to point out is that in Exodus, um, Pharaoh is fearing the foreigners and he makes, pol he has policies like we were talking about today that are very inhumane and cruel towards foreigners out of his own fear because, you know, he start he says that, that all the boys under the age of two, I think, need to be, need to be killed because he's afraid of the, the foreigners overtaking um, so it's just all throughout scripture, and we read in multiple places in the law that you um, you shall not oppress a resident alien, you know the heart of an alien, for you are aliens in the land of Egypt. We also know that the Israelites were wanderers in Egypt, or not in Egypt, after they left Egypt in the wilderness, and that uh, they were conquered eventually and were exiles, and so that means that they were under forced migration. And then... One thing I think is interesting to point out also is that God is not necessarily against borders or walls because the rebuilding of Jerusalem's walls in Nehemiah seems to be the, like ordained by God. You know, like God is telling them to rebuild their walls. And once they left the Garden of Eden, even then God guarded the Garden of Eden to keep it from, keep the humans from, um, doing more harm, eating from the tree of life and living forever in a sinful state. So walls, borders, not necessarily totally bad thing in scripture. Um, and then we know Jesus throughout scripture is very much about accepting the stranger and the foreigner. 
Um, I, I always, I almost forgot to put that like Jesus's family seeks asylum in Egypt, in Matthew when uh, Herod the Great is uh, wanting to kill kill the king Jesus, uh, and then we see that Jesus says, "I was a stranger and you invited me in." In Matthew 25, and then the Book of Acts is all about breaking through boundaries and going to places that were not you weren't supposed to go before and talking to people who were supposed to be unclean, breaking those boundaries, going to the Gentiles, bringing the good news. Um, and then the citizenship in heaven passage. And then at the end of scripture, there is, the, in Revelations, people from all nations come together. And then in Revelation 21, there's a city, the city of Jerusalem. It has walls, but the gates are never shut. Um, and people, it says, people will bring into the city the glory and honor of the nations. And so I think this shows us that God, even with a world where there's just lots of strife and division amongst different people of different nations, that God wants to redeem all of these things. And that's the hope that we have. So that's my very quick introduction to migration and borders in the Bible. Now, we get into the history of U.S. immigration because it's important to remember where we've been before we look at where, where we are now. And so, um, it's important to remember that this country was created and built upon by immigrants from England. Those were voluntary immigrants, and then there were also a lot of involuntary immigrants from Africa who came as slaves. And it's important to also remember that there were people living here before this and that they were cruelly displaced and killed. Um, and then even before that, <laughs> the Native Americans were descendants of migrants who took part in the great migration of the human species from Africa to Asia and Europe and then eventually the Americas, showing us once again that migration is just a part of what it means to be human. We're not truly home in, in, in this world. So the way that people could become a citizen was there were three ways for that. By being born here, by having parents that were in the U.S., or that were U.S. citizens, and then by pledging allegiance to the new nation. And so as of the Naturalization Act of 1790, any free white person, right, of uh, good character who had been living here for at least two years could become a citizen. And so it's important to note that racism was in the system from the very beginning. And uh, non-white people couldn't be citizens with constitutional protections until the 14th Amendment was passed in 1868. And then I thought this was interesting. Native Americans were excluded from being citizens until 1924, which is kind of crazy. So, and one thing that I did was one of the most reflective moments of the trip was in a time when we were all gathered together and some of our clergy who were immigrants from other countries started to tell us about the racism that they experience and that their children experience on a daily you know, basis. And that was just hard to hear, <laughs> that that still is, is going on and that um, <coughs> even if we don't want that to be the case, that there's racism still embedded in our systems and our, our society. So this was one of the slides that Azalea, the federal attorney showed us that there are four phases of American immigration, basically. And I'm, like, I'm gonna go through these pretty quick. So the first ha wave happened before the Civil War. A large amount of those immigrants were from I Ireland because of the Irish potato famine. And then we know um, in 1849, America's first anti-immigration political party was created, the Know Nothing Party. I think that's a weird name to call yourself. Uh, and then after the Civil War, some states tried to pass their own immigration laws, which I think is also interesting. In 1875, the Supreme Court declared that it was the federal government's responsibility to create policy and enforce immigration laws. And then from the 18, 1880 to 1920, more than 20 million immigrants arrived. And many of, most of them are from Southern, Eastern, and Central Europe. And um, in 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was the first uh, time that the US placed broad restrictions on an immigrant group. So it said that immigrants, Chinese immigrants couldn't even enter the US, not even talking about citizenship. And then 
The Immigration Act of 1917 was due to rising xenophobia and isolationism before World War I, and so the U.S. established literacy requirements for immigrants entering the country and halts immigration for most of the Asian people from Asian countries. And so there was a kind of a lull in immigration for a while then. Um, and then we got the Immigration Act of 1924, which limits, limited the number of immigrants allowed to enter the U.S. annually by nationality quotas. And this was very based on race, very racist eugenics, the idea that some races are superior to others. And so it favored people from Northern and Western European countries. And it was very much like even Central Europe and Southern Eastern Europe were, you know, those were a, a lesser race considered back then. Uh, changes, changing conceptions of race over time, because we wouldn't think that today, right? Like someone from Italy, we would think of as white, but they were thought of as a different race. And then excluded immigrants from Asia, Asia continually. Um, one thing I think is interesting is that there were not restrictions on Western Hemisphere migration at this point. So a lot of the migrant workers were seasonal. They would come and work on the fields, and then go back home. It was very circular migration. It wasn't limited. It's good for the economy. You'll see that during World War II, labor shortages made it so that we created the Bracero program. Bracero is like your arm. And so it's saying that Mexican agricultural workers were allowed to enter the U.S. temporarily. Okay. And then after World War II, the United Nations created, an, um, created international laws requiring countries to recognize the right of people to seek asylum. And this is important because they made this fault, this thing because of all of the Jewish refugees who were turned away from countries when they were fleeing the terrible, terrible Holocaust and the things going on in Germany. So that's why that, that act was created, or that law. And we reinforced the law with the US Refugee Act of 1980. And then, um, in 1952, we ended exclusion of Asian immigrants to the US. And then in 1965, the Immigration and Nationality Act ends the national origins quotas and established a new system based on preferences. We'll talk about that in a second. Uh, the system hasn't changed that much since 1965. That's basically the shape of our system now. It did place the Western Hemisphere under immigration caps for the first time when this act was made, which means that People who before weren't even being counted, and they were coming and working here and then going home, that now they were, there were caps on how many of them could come. So it, it, this was a very good move in the sense that it was not discriminatory against people based on race like other policies have been in the past, but it also had some unintended consequences. So we're going to pause because we're talking about 1965. That's the current way that we do our immigration system and talk about the immigration system a little bit. So here, this is a slide I showed in, script, in, in worship today. Um, and you'll see the green is, means permanent. Uh, it's a pathway to permanent residence. Red means that the colors are really messed up, sorry. Um, that it's, uh, it's temporary, uh, only a temporary pathway. So fam the first way that you can become a, per a resident in the United States is by being a family member of a US citizen or a lawful permanent resident, which is someone with a green card. And this can take a very long time depending on the person's relationship and what country they're coming from. So spouses and children of people that, children of un under 21 of US citizens have no wait time for a visa, so that's good. Uh, a sibling though of a US citizen from Mexico has to wait over 20 years. They are currently processing or issuing visas for people who applied in August of 2000. So there's a visa bulletin I think you can look at online if you're really curious. It'll tell you where people from different countries, how long they have to wait based on their relationship to whoever's in the US. Then employment's really complicated, but there are very few ways that it can lead to permanent residence. It costs employers thousands of dollars, even for temporary workers, and there are a lot fewer spots open than there are applications. Then humanitarian relief is the next big category. 
So there's two temporary statuses that I, I mean, it's more complicated than this, but I'm really trying to make it less complicated. <laughs> so temporary protected status is granted in 18 month in increments to a person from a country that's in crisis. Um, and these are countries that the US identifies. And so right now, like Ukraine is one of those countries. I think Venezuela is one of those countries. And it doesn't mean everyone from those countries can just come on over, but um, it's, it's a way for them to get quicker temporary protection here. Then a parolee is a person who's allowed to enter the US for a specific time frame, usually one to two years, for reasons like medical treatment, settling the state of a deceased person, and protection from war or natural disaster. And this requires a sponsor from the U.S. who fills out paperwork and says, yes, I can support this person financially while they are here in the U.S. Okay, this is the permanent version, or the permanent side of the humanitarian relief category. Um, so one thing I didn't talk about in the service was that there are visas for people who have been victims of certain crimes in the U.S., human trafficking or abuse. Often they have to agree to cooperate with law enforcement in basically getting the person prosecuted who did the crime. Then there's asylum and refugees, which we talked about in worship today, so I'm not gonna read that definition again. And like I said, refugees apply from a different country, asylum seekers apply in our country or at a port of entry. So this is a deeper look at asylum seekers um, the average time it takes right now, there's a huge backlog in asylum cases, is four and a half years. Those who don't qualify are generally deported. It's an illegal action, like I said, in worship, worship today. Um, many asylum seekers are unaccompanied minors. And then one thing to note is that people who are fleeing from natural disasters or extreme life-threatening poverty don't count as asylum seekers. Um, and also there's some wiggle gray area about gang violence or domestic abuse. So those, those two things, sometimes you can get asylum for. So getting any of these legal statuses, except for maybe like a tourist visa or something like that, generally takes a lot of time and a lot of times it takes a lot of money too. And it's complex, confusing and frustrating. I have friends who are in the midst of this who are clergy that are trying to get through this process and it's it's very frustrating for them. If you don't fill out everything right or do everything right, you risk losing your legal status, even if you technically qualify. Um, so it's important for immigrants to have immigration lawyers and help. Um, they're not guaranteed an employee though because most immigration cases uh, are in the civil side, not the criminal side of our law. And um, so, one thing though that's interesting that is that asylum seekers who have an attorney are at least three times more likely to be granted asylum than those that don't have an attorney, showing us that many people who are applying for asylum without an attorney are likely still, they would qualify if they had the right help. And so they're being sent back to dangerous places because they don't have the help they need. Marissa? Yes. Yeah, they, they don't, they're not required, or they're not given a, an attorney, they have to find one, even if they're in detention, which I think is an interesting expectation. Um, how are they supposed to have, call some, who are they even supposed to call at that point? I don't know. So it's, um, yeah, it's not, it's not necessarily set up for their success. Yeah. So because everything's so complicated, and because many are not even eligible for temporary, or especially permanent residents by going through the system, many live in the shadows as undocumented immigrants. And one book I was reading was like, neither slave nor free, it's kind of the shadow existence. Um, this means they don't have a valid visa or other immigration documentation. A lot of these people have overstayed a temporary visa. Some have entered the US without inspection. I think it's also important to talk about the importance of language, because a lot of times we say illegal immigrant, or even worse, illegal alien. But I don't think we call anyone else an illegal person. Like, even a person that has committed murder and that's in jail, they're not an illegal person. 
like calling someone illegal means like their existence is illegal. <laughs> so I think the word undocumented or unauthorized is a much better term for us to be using. And alien just has so many bad connotations. It makes us look at people not as people. Oh, I must have had that slide twice. Okay, so now we go back to the history side, since we now have an idea of what the system looks like now. In 1986, President Reagan signed an immigration reform bill into law that had tighter security at the Mexican border, penalties for employers who hired undocumented workers, and then made any immigrant who had entered the country before 1982 eligible for amnesty. So three million people were granted amnesty. The 9-11 happened and that changed things, made things a, little, a, lot, a lot more um, strict. President Bush passed the Homeland Security Act. Um, it created the Department of Homeland Security, which would oversee agencies that dealt with immigration. I didn't realize it wasn't a thing before then. Maybe you did, but I didn't realize that. Um, immigration enforcement and spending increased greatly. Azalea, the attorney, said that the U.S. needed an enemy, and that's where we decided our enemy should be. Uh, she said, it's ironic because the people that did the terrorist attacks crossed the Canadian border, not the southern border. I, didn't, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what she said. Um, and so as things got stricter at the border, it was a there was a decrease in that circular migration for seasonal workers who often are, were doing the agricultural work. And then the border wall. Um, this apparently started very limited construction during President Bill Clinton, but then in 2006, um, the, the Secure Fence Act, Act mandated the Department of Homeland Security to construct 700 miles of border wall on the U.S. Mexico border. Only 350 of those miles were actually constructed. And then in 2018, major border wall construction happened under the Trump administration. Uh, 458 miles were constructed. The border, though, is 1,900 miles. So when we were there in Texas, there were many places where there was no wall, and then you'd get to a place and there'd be a wall. Um, there's no correlation, this was from the presenters, between the border wall and apprehensions at the border. Um, and then this is something I learned. The wall is not actually the border in many places because the river, Rio Grande River, is the border. And so the wall can't be built on the river. And so it's built like some places 15 miles from the river. And so when we were looking out of the wall, we were looking through the bars, looking into from the US to the US, <laughs> separates the US from the US in many places. Um, so it's just, it's a weird dynamic, um, and that, that causes a lot of flooding problems. The wall has also caused a lot of wildlife um, destruction, and then one thing that they, the presenters told us was that the Secretary of Homeland Security can disregard any laws to build the wall, so like, they can just disregard protected wildlife refuge, refuges and Native American sacred sites like the wall's been built on Native American burial grounds that are sacred. In 2012, there's the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, and I think many of us know what that is, and you can read it, but I'm not gonna talk about it. And then in 2014, there was a start of a surge of asylum seekers from Central and South America, America especially many unaccompanied migrants and families, minors and families. Um, and then this is important to note that there was an increase everywhere in the Western Hemisphere in asylum seekers due to gang and cartel violence, political instability, natural disasters, and economic ruin. So in 2018, the zero tolerance policy was passed by the Trump administration. It meant, this is, uh, Azalea told us a lot about this. Every immigrant, including asylum seekers trying to cross the border anywhere other than at an official port of entry, was criminally prosecuted. And like I said at one point, usually immigration is dealt with on the civil side, not the criminal side. So this meant that every, all of these immigrants had to go to court 
And so as Aelia told us that before COVID happened, they would have 75 people tr tried in the morning and 75 people in the afternoon, and they would be in this massive group. And the judge would just point at them, not even say their names and convict them. They would tell them all to plead guilty because if they didn't plead guilty, then they'd go to jail and then they'd be deported. So uh, that, that's what happened. Um, immigrants would go to court and mass and plead guilty, like I said, okay. Uh, Chris, yeah? What happened if they pled guilty? If they pled guilty, they still got deported, but then they didn't go to prison. Oh, okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Um, this caused family se separation because children couldn't be in jail with adults. And so 5,500 children were separated from their parents and 500 are still not reunited with their parents. They don't know where they are because they didn't keep track of those things. Um, Azalea talked about how this boosted the immigration industrial complex. You hear about the prison industrial complex. Um, it's a huge money thing. There's lots of uh, money involved in maintaining detention facilities and the, the institutions that handle all these immigration matters. Um, the Biden administration did end the zero tolerance policy. And then also during the Trump administration in 2019, there was the migrant protection, protection protocols, mm -hmm. which um, was referred to as the Remain in Mexico pro program. Asylum seekers who arrived at the southern border were given notices to appear in immigration court and sent back to Mexico to wait. So they were waiting in very dangerous border towns for an unspecified amount of time. And uh, it put them in, in really bad situations. So this was, was also in by the Biden administration, but we'll learn that it's still happening. <laughs> So in 2020, when the COVID pandemic hit, there's something called Title 42 that was invoked. And this is something that was in law, but because a pandemic came, it could be used. It grants the government the ability to take emergency action, including to stop the introduction of communicable diseases. Um, so they, they interpret it as it allows us to expel immigrants, even asylum seekers, without due process. So immigrants are sent to Mexico or to their home countries. There's no consequences for crossing at this point because you're not being processed. So there's been an increase in repeat crossings. One person he told us was on his 26th attempt. That's a lot of, he has a lot of perseverance. Um, but this is very timely because this Title 42 will end once the COVID emergency, the public health emergency ends on May 11th, which is Thursday of this week. And so it, the country is, uh, there's a lot of anxiety about uh, how the number of immigrants trying to cross the border who have been waiting and waiting and waiting in Mexico for a very long time, that they, they will try to cross the border. Um, so here are the newest policies that are meant to address some of those concerns. First is this thing called the CBP-1 app. It requires asylum seekers to use a smartphone app to schedule an asylum appointment before entering the U.S. Now, let me ask you, how many asylum seekers have a smartphone, and how many of them have internet access? Forces, it forces them, like the Remain in Mexico thing, to stay in these dangerous border towns. 750 appointment slots open every day. They're gone within seconds. And so many people try each day for months to get an appointment to no avail. It's very frustrating for them, as you can imagine, and many there's many te technical problems with the app that just exacerbate the issues. And then tw this is pretty recent. In 2023, Biden administration an announced that it will generally deny asylum to immigrants who show up at the U.S. southern border without first seeking asylum in a country that they passed through. And that might be problematic because those countries may not have a very robust system for that, and also because some of those countries are not necessarily safe either. Um, the policy is proposed in preparation for the end of Title 42. Um, so then, here are more proposed policies for steps after Title 42 ends. The continuation of the use of the CBP-1 app, increasing the amount of daily appointments to like a thousand, I think. 
Um, opening, this is interesting, I think not a bad idea, opening processing centers in Latin America where people in the Western Hemisphere sphere will be able to request asylum or refugee status in their, in their home country and then aided to get to the place where they need to go. Um, there's three countries that are, have agreed to take asylum seekers as a part of this agreement, US, Canada, and Spain. So it's a po I think it's, the, it's a promising thing. The first centers will be in Guatemala and Colombia. There will be family reunification program for people from El Salvador, Guatemala, Honduras, and Colombia. And increased parole programs, which means like they can come here for a temporary amount of time for Cubans, Haitians, Nicaraguans, and Venezuelans. A lot of those countries are in a great deal of strife right now. These are all to make it so there are more, hopefully, legal pathways for asylum seekers and that they don't have to make that really dangerous journey from their home country to the Mex US Mexico border. Um, the third nation asylum policy that we talked about will be put into effect most likely and then we'll revert to something called Title VIII, which is just a fancy way of saying all of our immigration laws <laughs> that aren't during COVID time. So immigrants will need to be processed instead of simply expelled and there will be um, expedited removal. So immigrants who do not use one of the legal pathways that are being proposed here will be deported and get a five-year ban on legally entering the United States. Also this week we learned that there are, there's going to be a deployment of 1,500 troops to the southern border this week to prepare for all of this that's going to be happening. So it's, I, I don't know what's going to happen. We're going we're gonna to see. And I also think that um, I worry that these legal pathways, the people that are asylum seekers will not be knowledgeable about them and, you know, by no fault of their own really come and then get sentenced to that five-year ban. That's what I'm a little worried about. I don't know what's going to happen. So that's the current, what's going on right now. It's very, like, very timely. I wanted to give us just a little bit of statistics to help us understand, like, how does now compare to in the past with immigration? So in 2021, I believe, there were more apprehensions at the border than there have been in the past. But it's important to remember why this might be the case. First of all, like I said, immigrants were re-entering the country at a much higher rate than in the past because there was no consequence for doing so under Title 42. Second of all, they changed the way that they counted people. It wasn't just apprehensions, it was encounters. So not just when you like detain someone, but even if you just, you know, made them go back to Mexico right away, that was counted. So it's hard for us to know, like actually what are the numbers <laughs> because they're not, it's, they're counted differently. Um, the number of individuals encountered, individuals encountered in 2021 was considerably lower than the number of encounters that we see here. Then where are immigrants coming from? In the past, it's been like even more of a majority in Mexico, but now we see that there's there's definitely more diversity. There's the they call it the the north or the the triangle, the central triangle. I can't remember the term right now. The northern triangle, something. It's El Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala, where there's just a lot of gang violence going on right now. There, there's a lot of immigrants from there. Venezuela is in economic ruin right now. I mean, they, their inflation is insane there. Um, then you'll see the other countries. Okay, and then this is the percentage of the population that is foreign born in our country. You'll see that it's 13.6 as of 2017. And then right now I found the statistic 14.6%. The highest it's ever been was 14.8%. So it's pretty high right now, but not the highest it's ever been. Carissa? Yeah. When they deport them back to the, if they come into the United States and they're from Honduras or Guatemala or whatever it is, do they deport them back to Mexico where they come from or do they take them to the country they are from? It depends. So Mexico is determined that there are certain groups of immigrants they will not take back. And I don't know why, there's probably political reasons. They're changing some of those policies lately. Um, 
they will not take unaccompanied minors back. And so um, most people, I think, are expelled back to Mexico, but some are flown back to their, their countries. It's my understanding of that. Um, this shows just like uh, an estimation of how many, what percentage of our immigration, immigrant population is unauthorized immigrants. I've heard that that number now is 11 million, not 10.5. Um, and then temporary lawful residents, I thought naturalized citizens, I was surprised it was that large of a percentage. And then uh, lawful permanent residents. So. Oh, sorry. Um, this is just to show you the, the court backlog for asylum seeking right now. It's, it's an insane how many cases are just waiting to be, to be processed. A lot of that is because of COVID-19 slowing things down. And then there's this perception that immigration will increase crime. And they were very clear about this on the trip that that's not, the statistics don't really show that that's the case. Um, you'll see that undocumented immigrants have the lowest violent crime rate. This is from Texas data because they haven't really done the study in other states yet. And that's probably because if they got caught doing something they shouldn't be doing, they'd be getting deported. So, um, and then legal immigrants are still lower than US citizens. Just kind of changes our perception, our stereotypes. And then this is a, a thing about migrant deaths recorded at the southern border. And I, I didn't, I couldn't believe how much of a spike that was recently. And I'm wondering, like I said today, is that due to more stringent policies on our part? Does that make a difference? Or are they just- Are we figuring that? It could be. And, and also, they, maybe they, I know that the Border Patrol agents did tell us about how there were, they, they had amped up their rescue efforts a lot. Um, so maybe that's part of the reason why they're just finding more of them. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about just the reality of immigrants today. I could tell you a lot about these things, so it'll be hard to choose which ones, but first is the journey. If people are coming from anywhere in Mexico or in Central and South America, and many people will fly from other countries to South or Central America, and they make the journey north. They ride a lot of times on something called la bestia, which means the beast, it's a train. And they jump on the train, and they ride on top of it. And it's very dangerous, and people die all the time. There's also a lot of gangs and drug cartels along the route who control the territory, and they're, they're a danger to these immigrants. Coyotes are often in cahoots with these gangs and cartels. And so these are the people that are paid to get the immigrants safely on the journey through to the US border and past the border. And the border patrol agents were telling us some of the things that these coyotes will do. Um, they'll convince a group of migrants, like hundred of them, to, to go through the border at one point where they know they'll be detected as a distraction. So all the, the CBP, the Border Patrol people, come, get those migrants, and then they'll have someone with drugs sneak by at a different place on the border. So the coyotes are in it mainly for themselves, out of self-interest, and are not trusted. But in one of the books I was reading, it said that for an unaccompanied minor girl, it costs $3,000 to hire a coyote to get your child safely to the border. And then for a boy, it's $4,000. I don't know why it's higher for a boy, but that's just what I read. Um, there's a lot of sexual assault that happens. One person told us that a lot of women take birth control before the trip just because they know that it's gonna happen, which is really, really sad. Uh, the stash houses were something I talked about in the service and they've just found, it sounds absolutely awful. The Border Patrol people were telling us the conditions. Um, like we talked about, there are a lot of migrant deaths. Um, one thing in the desert is the, you need water and there's 
there's a need for, for clean drinking water. And so there are blue jugs of water placed at certain points that different organizations fill up with clean water. And um, the Border Patrol people said that if people are more desperate enough, they'll drink out of the cow troughs mm -hmm. and then they'll get very sick from that. Mm -hmm. um, I really was impressed by the two Border Patrol agents that we talked to because they very much um, talked about how you know they've seen other agents give their their lunch their water bottle you know even their shoes to a migrant who's in a really bad state and so i think a lot of times we have this perception of border patrol as like the bad guys maybe um, and they're doing a job that's important in many ways there's a lot of really bad things trying to get into the u.s too um, so it's i think it's just important for us i mean some people uh, apparently, one of the other presenters that presented to a group a few months ago was talking about the joy he gets from chasing down the immigrants. So, you know, there's, there's in any career you have different, you have people who are, who are different. And so, but I was impressed by the ones that we talked to. Um, and then a lot of times immigrants turn themselves into Border Patrol. The minute they enter the U.S., they're looking for a Border Patrol agent because they want to seek asylum and they know that that's a legal way to do things. Uh, so they're not necessarily trying to always sneak past. They want to be found. Um, this is the reality of immigrants today in the United States. I need to check my time, okay. Um, so there are processing facilities and it's because there's just a huge increase in the amount of immigrants or have been in recent years, um, they've definitely had issues with having enough of these Right now, there's a big tent, apparently really close to where we were, that the, and the immigrants can only stay there legally uh, by US law for a certain amount of days because they're really not meant to house people. So I think for, for minors, it's 72 hours that you can have someone in these facilities. So they're trying to process them really quick. If they um, are, uh, they, they then go to the detention centers or they're like sent, they, they go into the country and are told you need to come back for your immigration court date. So detention centers just really to make sure someone comes to their court date and is also used for people that the U.S. is concerned about. They, they haven't committed a crime necessarily, but they're concerned about for whatever reason. Um, and so there are alternatives to detention that have been proved to be very, very good and have worked well, including which I don't know how you feel about this, but like the ankle thing that they give people who are on parole uh, or case managers who will just check in with the immigrants and make sure they get to their court date. Um, like I said, there is racism in the system and immigrants are facing that on a, on a very daily basis. And one of our presenters is sharing like the percentage of asylum cases for people of color that get approved is lower than the percentage for people that are white, um, which is interesting. And nobody's trying to do that. <laughs> it just happens because of the way our society is. Um, language barrier is a big issue, and I think most of the paperwork, if not all, is English. Fill, you need to fill it out in English. Um, like I said, work permits are hard to get. It takes a year right now, I think, to get one. So it's it's hard for immigrants to work, and so they have to have a sponsor, someone who can help them out, uh, or find an organization that's going to help them. A lot of immigrants are abused at work once they are working, because especially if they're undocumented or asylum process and haven't been approved yet, they're afraid of reporting things to the police because they might get deported. Um, and then, I've, I've already talked about those things. Carissa? Yes. As far as the language barrier, that's also slightly by design because even in the hospital, forms for filling out a birth certificate or consents mm -hmm. for treatment or the Patient Privacy Act, all of those things we have in Spanish. Mm -hmm and we have interpreter lines throughout the entire place. Mm. And so if they do not have paperwork in an understandable language with interpreters, mm. it is completely by design. Mm. There's no reason not to have it. Mm. Yeah. The, all, the CBP-1 app is in Spanish, Haitian Creole, and English. So if you speak any other language than that, 
you can't use the app very well. So it's interesting. There's a lot of indigenous people from Central America that don't speak Spanish or speak it as a second language. Carissa, how many, just, and I know you won't know the answer to this, but <laughs> how many of the immigrants that come over actually know how to speak English? Is there very many or is most of them? I don't know the answer to that, Danny, but I know that I looked at some statistics about that and it said like, of all the immigrants in the US, it was like 50% were proficient or something like that in English, but don't quote me on that. Yeah. Pew Research has some data, but I don't know about ones that are coming to the border. Okay. I'd assume that the, the rate is lower there. Okay. Um, this is about the reality for Border Patrol agents today, so it's important to remember, remember that they're dealing with this every day. Um, like I said, there's more humanitarian relief and rescue efforts. Um, a lot of times, the Border Patrol people are the ones caring for the immigrants at these processing facilities, watching over kids, doing things that like social workers would normally be doing because they don't, they're not provided that. A lot of uh, Border Patrol agents would really like if there were more social workers and things like that provided to them. Um, they encounter very, very difficult situations. So uh, Sister Norma at the Respite Center told us the story of a Border Patrol agent who said that he liked his job until he met a mother and her daughter at the border. They were fleeing because the dad had been killed by the gangs and the daughter, who's 10, had been raped by the gang members and she was pregnant. So that's like tough stuff that they're dealing with. And so they receive counseling as a part of their job. And um, the, the Border Patrol agent said that drug cartels are always one step ahead of them with technology. They're talking about the drones and the things that they use. Um, and they talked about how minors are being recruited by cartels to smuggle people and drugs. And told a story, fairly recent story, about um, this minor who was convinced by one of the cartels to drive a trailer of immigrants across the border. And the Border Patrol got behind them, they got scared, and they sped up and got in an accident, and all of the immigrants that were in the trailer passed away. Mm. So um, they're really working on education in the schools to try to get to show kids that it's not good to work with the cartels. And this is a quote from the one of the agents. He said, call your representatives and get them to change immigration so that it doesn't take so long for people to enter the right way. I thought that was a good quote from him. And then the last, one of the last things I want to talk about is the re reality for Americans today. So we do have to talk about like, this is a lot of people that are coming into the country and it puts a strain on our resources and our institutions. I have heard from teachers who are at schools with high end. Switching the mic. Okay, there we go. Who have high undocumented immigrant populations where, you know, it, and have very little English background, how difficult it is to be in those situations, how the kids will be there one day and gone the next because. What, who knows what happened to them. And this can be very disruptive for the classroom in general. So this is one reality that is hard. Cities also don't always have the resources to have proper facilities to house immigrants as they come. Um, I know the mayor of New York, I think it's the mayor, just called on President Biden a few weeks ago and said, we need to change the policies, make it easier for people to get work permits because we have thousands of immigrants who we are housing in our shelters, our emergency shelters, and that can't work and support themselves, and they want to work. And um, so there's, there's that that is difficult as well. And a lot of immigrants go to a few select cities throughout the US is what gets most of the immigrants because maybe they have family there already or friends. So like New York, Los Angeles, Miami, those are some of the ones. The U.S. is also experiencing a lot of labor shortages right now. Maybe you've noticed um, when you go to like Arby's and the lobby's closed because there's no there's nobody there to work. Um, and so one thing that Azalea talked a lot about is like we we need workers, and there are people who want to work, and they're they're immigrants a lot of times. 
And then there's just this question that we all struggle with or that we all have to wrestle with is, do we see immigrants as an opportunity or a threat? And I just think that's a good question for us to be wrestling with and that a lot of people are, are talking about. I hope we see it as more of an opportunity because I think that if we see it as a threat, our, our reaction will not help the situation. Charissa? Yes. I put challenge up there. Challenge. I like that. Good. It is a challenge, for sure. Like, it's not an easy situation by any means. I don't have the answers. I try to figure out, like, read articles about what are good immigration policy reform ideas. I didn't find very much, honestly. So, um, I think we have to think outside of the box a lot. I'd say the first step is to quit trying to categorize and just see them as human. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I just wrote this. This is how to respond, and then this is my last slide, which we actually got through them all. Woohoo! <laughs> um, so what we're doing isn't working very well and isn't humane. I, just the processing times in and of themselves are ridiculous. We're leaving people hanging for years when we should just say, you're in or you're out. You know, there's there's got to be an answer faster. I think we need to think outside of the box. I also think we need to focus not just on prosecution, but also on prevention in a holistic manner. Because, you know, it's like with the, the drug problem in the US. So much of what we do is prosecution, putting people in jail. There's not a ton of rehab of, you know, trying to address the drug problem before it even starts in a person. And, and so, um, we cannot become isolated as a country and only focus on ourselves and what's best for us. And we must recognize the ways that we contribute to the situations that migrants are fleeing as a country. Because who is the number one consumer of the drugs being trafficked? The US. So one of the ways that we could be addressing immigration would be by addressing our drug problem in the US. Um, and other things in our past, you know, meddling in the governments of other countries and supporting leaders who were dictators because they weren't communists, <laughs> but they're dictators. And, and at that point, there's a lot of instability in these countries that continues to this day because of things like that. And so how, how are we addressing the situations in these countries? Um, in a way that's not coming in and being like, hey, I'm a superhero. Like, it's a white savior complex, but in a way that's working with people and empowering people. Um, we also need to keep in mind the need to protect and care for ourselves. I was thinking and reflecting a lot on like boundaries. I had Pastor Braz talked about boundaries and the importance of them for us as people. I think that that's also true about nations. So, but that's a good question. Like, where do you draw the boundaries? And then we can care for immigrants who are right here among us, because they are there. Uh, Jaina Greenwood is on our community listening team. We talked to the English language learning director for the 501 school district, and she said that there are many unaccompanied minors in our Topeka schools, and uh, that they have sponsors here in Topeka, but the sponsors sometimes are taking advantage of them. Mm -hmm. you, you know, they're having the, the, the students work, when they're not in school and then taking all their wages or something like that. So there's there's problems here in Topeka. And then we have the Ukraine, we have a lot of Ukrainian um, refugees here too. And Grace Morrison and Mike Morrison are sponsors for 11 of them, I think. And so we're already doing it. Some of you are already helping with those things. It's just a continuation of those efforts. And the sheet I gave out at the service has some of those ideas. I'm really excited about the VITA ministry. I want to go and be a conversation partner with someone because that sounds fun. Just treating people like people too is a good thing because they haven't been treated like people for a while. And then to pray. So that's my presentation. And now it's time for questions. <laughs> Questions? In, in the community where you were, you said 99% were Hispanic, but of those, how many were undocumented versus actual residents mm -hmm. who have a long time presence? Uh, how much was transient? Uh, uh, it's, it's pretty 
not undocumented. A lot of undocumented immigrants like disperse across the U.S. It's not like they all stay in Texas so or at the border. She was an actual living, breathing uh, Hispanic community. Yeah, and a lot of them, like their parents, came over here, you know, yeah. seventy no, five years ago. Them. Yeah, they yeah, they. Well. Sp yeah. When we went to El Buen Pastor Church. We talked with them, a lot of them, and they told us the stories of like, oh yeah, my my great great grandparents, you know, <laughs> were because that border. One thing is that it used to be a lot more like fluid. People would move across that border a lot easier to see family and you know just to go. It was it was not strict, and there was a, a sense of community between the border towns and the tech on tech on the Texas side and the Mexico side, um, and. You know, now it's changed for in, in many stark ways. But yeah, it was, but then there are the places called colonias, is what they call them, and I'm still learning about them. I don't understand it fully. There are places that are not within city limits and county limits, and there are places that are like neighborhoods of people that are very poor, that don't have infrastructure, have, like they used to not have running water and electricity or roads. And now, like, they're starting to put those things in these places, but um, even those, they said, don't have a huge percentage of undocumented immigrants, but they're very poor places. So, Calista, I do. So, you were sent down there as part of a group out of the conference? Yes. So, my question is, like, what is the conference interest in all this, and how did all yeah. that work, and then what's Alcor doing? Cool. How, how are we connecting as Methodists? Yeah. That's a great question. Um, so the conference did this as the Mercy and Justice team because they're wanting to raise up, I think it's 16 new Mercy and ju or Justice leaders in the conference by 2016, or 2026. No, 26 by 26. I'm sorry, I'm not in the right year. 26 by 26. And um, and so they're doing three immersion trips. This was the first one. The second one is this summer, which you can apply for, I believe. It's going to Birmingham, Alabama and then multiple places in the civil rights thing. And then one, of, the third one will be to a Native American um, reservation. I think Bishop Wilson will be going on that one. And so they're just to uh, get people together who care about these issues and then see where it goes from there, really. Um, so out of this, one of the people on the trip who I'm getting ordained with this year, his name is Sun Lee, and he is, he decided to write a resolution to the annual conference on immigration. It was due like three days after he started writing it. And it's just um, taking a stance on this, you know, calling for our, our conference to take some action. So it got 267 signatures before he turned it in, in two days. So that, that's really exciting. And so there, there are hopes that out of this will come some justice leaders and then within the group that went, we're gonna start doing, if, if people want to, you, we're gonna start small groups going through the intercultural development plan inventory, which is something about cultural competency and just having discussions to, and, and keeping one another accountable for increasing in our cultural competency. Um, so yeah, those are some of the things we're doing out of this. Joy. So, if you had three top solutions, oh what would they start with? I'd I say, mean, really, oh is it a oh is it a, a a a village for these people to come and gather for a while and be fed and and educated and then sent? I mean, what is? What it's a great we, question, I, yeah. Joy. I think one thing is I think work permits need to be faster just in general, because and, and the opportunity to come and work in the US maybe needs to be easier than it is right now, because maybe people don't want to be here permanently, but they could be here temporarily on a work basis, and that could be another avenue for them. Right now, it's just really hard to do that. Um, so that's one very simple, or not simple, but like it wouldn't address the major issue. I think it could be a lot of different things. Another one mm -hmm. I really think is like, going to be working with these countries and trying to figure out how do we address this gang cartel problem that we've got, because that's really driving a lot of things. Um, 
Yeah, I don't know. That's a great question. Anybody? I, I would say that it's a really great time to accept that it's okay to be annoying to the people who write legislation. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay to bug them and bug them and bug them. There hasn't been overhaul of the immigration system since 1965, and there have been multiple proposals put before the legislature that haven't passed. I don't know what the content of those was, but it's a it's a, a great question, Joy, and I think I'm still struggling with that. Well, Bill was going to say something. Yeah, I think mine goes along with that one. I think I think something somehow needs to get into into Congress, mm. and I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I think, but somebody, some organization, something needs to get in there to get them, to wake them up to mm -hmm. what's going on. Because nothing is going to get done from a top level mm -hmm. until that happens. Yeah, one thing, that's a great point, Bill. One thing Sister Norma told us was that we need to invite our representatives to come and see what's happening at the border, to actually do this kind of an immersion trip themselves. And I thought that was a, a good yeah. idea. Yeah. Marianne? I think one thing that is a starting point is what you did here today, and that's educating people and helping increase awareness mm -hmm. of what is really going on. And you suggested different books and things that you've read, and you know, reading and just educating ourselves and mm -hmm. sharing with other people and trying to get good information out so mm -hmm. people know yeah. what the issue is. Yeah. I mean, Oh, sorry. Larry, did you have something? Yeah, I want to follow up on Judy's question. Uh, I gather that uh, one or more of the agencies or uh, places you visited are, met, are sponsored by yeah. the United Methodist Church. Um, if you have uh, UMCOR advance numbers for those, and you could publish them, that, that would be Okay, helpful. yeah, I don't know if all of them have one, but I know Manos Juntas, I think, does, and, and the handout I gave, I believe that the advanced number is on there. Mm -hmm. um, so, like Posada Providencia, the sanctuary place, I don't know if it's Methodist, but um, some Methodist person on the global board of missions or something like that, no. It's so the, the group that makes the social principles. I can't remember their name right now. Randall, do you know their name? Interim Board of Society. Yeah, Church and Society, thank you. Cindy Johnson's her name. And she was cool. She works at, at that place, and I could see if they've got um, UMCOR, if they're lined up with an UMCOR number. Yeah, that would be helpful because it's a way to do something immediate without uh, having to talk about the Congress and the- uh, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then and a totally different track. Yeah, on that sheet, there's also an opportunity to sign. Well, it's really to tell me that you want to be signed up for the Immigration Rapid Response Great Plains Conference thing. It's an email list, I think, that you get on. And I've gotten some of the emails where it's talking about, oh, the there's this policy being passed that will, um, you know, do this negative thing for our immigrant neighbors and here's how you can respond and write to your legislators. And so I appreciated that as a, it's, it's made it easy for me. Yes? That's a fun question, but I was just gonna reflect a little bit that I was just at a, a conference leadership meeting and we were talking about there, it's just an example of, uh, in our conference with Kansas and Nebraska, we have hundreds of international pastors. Some of the colleagues I think across, Chris was talking about going on this trip. We have hundreds of pastors across Kansas and Nebraska from Africa and Korea and the Philippines and from around the world. And we would be in a world of hurt mm -hmm. from our church, right? If yeah. we didn't have, we would have hundreds of pulpits that we would like, who's gonna lead these churches? We wouldn't know. So our conference has been really forward thinking in this. But we were just having this meeting talking about how hard it is to get 
approval mm -hmm. for these pastors to come work in the United States. And these are seminary trained, yeah. English speaking mm -hmm. persons who are trying to navigate this process. Mm -hmm. And we were talking for the conference, like we need to help. Yeah. One, it's really costly. And two, it's so complicated. So I'm, I'm thinking about that. I'm thinking about people who don't speak English, mm -hmm. who may not have any education, trying to navigate that process mm -hmm. and how impossible that is. Mm -hmm. um, so just the, the yeah. So it's just another example yeah. of how we have a lot of needs. We have jobs lined up for these people, but we need to fill these pulpits. Mm -hmm. And we and we have mm -hmm. trouble making that happen. That's mm -hmm. how hard it is in the system we have, the broken system we have. Yeah. Wow. Tracy. Would petitions help at all? I don't know. If you don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's the kind of thing, too, if you find certain ones and have links to them, mm -hmm. Could a summary of it with the link be put up on the church's web page, or is that overstepping? I don't know. I, I'm, we have to talk about that, probably the leadership council. Because then, it, if like it that. were all under one umbrella of, hey, if this is something you're interested in, mm -hmm. you can come to this website and this is where it is, mm -hmm. and it's just as simple as clicking and adding your name. Because mm -hmm. they have plenty of them where you can submit online. Yeah, yeah. So if you want to talk about these ideas afterwards, then definitely. Hi, Bob. Well, I'd just like to say, I think problem solving takes people coming together mm -hmm. and compromising. And right now, yes. you've got yeah. various sides that don't want to give the other side a victory. Yes. Something it's so like sad. It be perceived as a victory yeah. or I credit agree. for something, and it, it's obstacle. It is. It is. Yeah, awesome. that, that, that was definitely something that um, I think Azalea talked about, that this has become a political, immigration has become a political game. Um, and that's, that's one of the reasons she wanted, the art. no, that was Sister Norma, she thought that people should come and see instead of just um, making policies about people that they've, they've never met or seen before. Lois? I was interested in a picture on the front of our program this morning. Is that an actual picture of them putting the I think you saw him between there like that? I don't know for sure. Dream of somebody? I think that that's happened. I know that there have been like things to help people. You know, if if you're um, across the border and your loved one is over here, like you don't get to ever come and see your loved one. So that's really hard for people, especially if they were used to, before this point, not having as much uh, security on the border and being able to come back and forth. So I know that there were places, I've heard that they're not happening anymore, I don't know if it's because of COVID or not, where people can come and get communion from someone at the border, and or just places where they can have conversations with their loved ones. So I don't know. I think the seesaws are a real thing. I don't think they were photoshopped or anything. <laughs> there have been other images of like border patrol agents like playing ball with kids really? across the fence, like That's throwing cool. ball back and forth over the, over the wall. Nice. Anyone else? Well, guys, it's a it's a hard issue. It's overwhelming. I, my head's still spinning from everything. <laughs> I've been thinking about this so much ever since the trip and it's a lot to process, but it's something important to keep in front of us. Um, if you, like I said, if you'd be interested in even doing like a, a Bible study about migration in the Bible or something, let me know, because we could probably make that happen sometime. And I want to thank you for coming and for caring and for trying to wrestle with this issue that's not simple with in light of your faith. Yeah. yeah thank you. Thank you. prayer really quick okay Lord we just pray for all those who are on a journey whether forced or chosen we pray for their safety and protection we pray that you would provide for them we pray that you would help others to see them as human beings and to treat them as such Lord we are at a loss for words we feel overwhelmed. We don't know what to do, but we know what's happening isn't working. We pray for your wisdom and your guidance. 
We know that you are a God who restores broken things. We're grateful for the hope that you give us. Help us to not become hopeless, but to be creative and to find new ways forward. We pray for the policymakers, for the Border Patrol agents, for all organizations that are working with these immigrants. Bless them. Give them wisdom. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you.